please, please, please. Uh, thanks, Wes, and uh, and thank you so much to Ames for the opportunity to uh, to talk to you all about uh, something near and dear to my heart, and uh, I think something pretty exciting uh, for our business, which is uh, Katina, which is our open approach to interoperability. That's the title of the uh, of the session. So, you know, there there are a few trends in the industry that have um, have have kind of influenced us in uh, in undertaking this. Clearly, you know. Cloud computing for live media production and for really all media production has been become a thing, uh, and there's uh, a lot of momentum in in that area. Uh, along with moving to the cloud, I think you know multi vendor integration becomes much more important. It's always been important, uh, but when you move to the cloud and you move to microservice based architectures, you have the potential for a lot more vendors and a lot more uh, integration points, and so you need to be thoughtful about how those all uh, connect up. And then finally, uh, also a result of moving to the cloud, security has suddenly become really important to us in the media business. Not that security was not important before, but it was pretty easy in the, uh, in the old days before we did things in the cloud. Uh, security could be just air gapping your facility to the internet and hey, it's secure. You know, the only people who can get at things are people who can actually physically get at the, get at the boxes, get at the systems, and uh, so you know, your risk was pretty low. When you start putting things on the cloud, however, and you've got multiple touch points between things, you really need to think seriously about security because you have uh, a lot more exposure than, uh, than you did in the, in the old days. So the idea behind this Katina initiative, it, you can really be summed up it pretty easily in just really making it as easy as possible to secure, notice we've got security first here, uh, secure, connect, and control a multi-vendor ecosystem of media processing services and microservices, and actually more than that, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about that in a, in a minute. So just making it as easy as possible to connect up all of these solutions from multiple vendors is really the, that's the goal behind all of this. And so how do you do that? Really, the key then, you know, it, it, with any kind of integration is the communication between all of these different solutions. So what Katina uh, aims to do is, uh, and that was an intentional pun, aims, get it? Oh, sorry. <laughs> I guess I'm not a comedian, but uh, we, we, we're, we're wanting to standardize the communication methods between, you notice micro in parentheses here, microservices and not so microservices, but also full, you know, we're not, we're not forgetting about full monolithic products as well. Katina can be used for that as well. And really it's designed for the world that we live in today, which is really hybrid between cloud and on-prem solutions. And so it's really designed for all of that. It's not cloud only, uh, but it's certainly uh, designed with the cloud in mind, but you know, equally for uh, traditional solutions that you might be using. So you know, live, live video, live production is probably one of the most challenging things you can do in the media business. You don't get any, you know, there's no fix it and post. There's no do overs of anything. Things happen, and if they happen, great, wonderful. If they don't, you know, we kind of have to move on. And um, yeah, like I said, it's you know, backups are nice, but they can't really help us a whole lot in in live production. So, um, so really, we wanted to come up with something that that could satisfy a wide variety of needs. Initially targeted at live production because I think it's the most challenging use case that's out there. Be able to support multiple vendors simultaneously. Uh, again, that's the reality. Um, satisfying complex and diverse needs. Um, and, and really, a, a key here is scalability. So e efficient enough so that if you're doing very, very large scale productions or deployments, or you got a facility that's a, you know, very much an enterprise scale facility, that it, uh, we don't have scaling issues there. And there's been a lot of work put into Katina to make sure it scales up to incredibly high volumes of, uh, of messages and services. Um, another key is that you're able to plug and play devices into your ecosystem while operational. So again, if you think about you know, the worst case being live production, you can't shut down your production in the middle of, uh, you know, you're, you're doing a baseball game, you can't say, Hey, stop! I'm plugging in a new service to uh, to do a uh, a new graphic for uh, the balls and strikes. 
You can't do that sort of thing. We want to be able to plug and play things in dynamically uh, and seamlessly while things are actually uh, happening. Uh, and like I said earlier, secure enough for hybrid cloud and ground uh, environments, and cloud being the more challenging of those. So the you know, Katina is uh, it's an interesting name. We decided it was it made a lot of sense to give this actually a name. It's easier to remember than you know if it ends up being Simpty, you know, two thousand two hundred and fifty two, doesn't really roll off the tongue. But so we decided you know a name would be easier for people to remember it by and a meaningful name. So Katina is a word that's defined as a connected series of related things. And that's what this enables, is you think about a connected series of related, say, microservices. Uh, that's what it, this allows um, to, uh, to work a whole lot easier. When we came up with the Katina idea, it was not something that we came up with uh, just out of thin air. Uh, it's based on something that Ross Video has had for uh, about 16 years now. Uh, it's an Emmy Award winning, uh, Open Gear, which hopefully a lot of you are familiar with open gear from uh, uh, from Ross video and it's been something that we've had for for quite a while um, widely used in in Ross products obviously but in uh, a wide array of partner organizations uh, it's and it's fully intended to enable multi-vendor interoperability on-prem so again 16 years ago we weren't thinking about producing things in the cloud now we are so it was time to have an evolution of open gear, and that's really what Katina is, is an evolution of, of, uh, of open gear into cloud and on-prem environments. So you know, the open gear in the past, and it was uh, at its heart was a protocol called, o called OGP. Um, that's always been you know, a fully ROS owned and controlled, and we like to say benevolently, we're nice about it. Anybody who wants to use it, you know, we welcome everybody into the network to, uh, to use that. Uh, this whole idea was to make it easy for, for multiple vendors to, uh, to use. However, we recognized early on, if we're gonna take this type of model to the cloud, ROS video managing it was going to get probably uh, untenable uh, when you think about when you expand to like a microservices world where you've got hundreds or even thousands of services, that's not the business that we're in. We're not in the man in, in the, the business of managing services, uh, of of, uh, of in integrating all of that. So, so really, uh, we said we're going to take this and make it an open standard, and we're going to open source it. Uh, we have no interest in controlling that uh, at a at a cloud scale, uh, and so so that's really why this is. Uh, going in the direction that it is. Uh, so the idea here, again, I mentioned open sourcing it, gonna get it out on GitHub for anybody uh, who wants to contribute to it, first of all, uh, and anybody who wants to use it uh, will have uh, have SDKs they can access, um, have everything they, that they would possibly need to implement Katina up there. But then also the goal is to have this published as a SMPTE standard. One message that we got loud and clear from our customers is they want this to be a standard. They don't want it to be something that Ross Video has just kind of come up with. They want it to go through a, you know, a proper process. And if it's got a Simpty logo on it, that it gives people a, a sense of comfort, right? That it's it's not gonna be changed. And you know if we decide not to be benevolent down the road, uh, that they're gonna have any problems. Not that we would do that, but... Um, so, uh, so that's the plan is to, you know, this, we're, we're kind of positioning this as a gift to the industry uh, that we've got 16 years of experience building these multi-vendor uh, integrations with Open Gear. And um, we've put a ton of work into evolving this into Katina. Um, and uh, probably a good point for me to talk about what actually is included in this. So what we see is the kind of the key elements of Katina are these six elements that you'll see uh, in front of me. So you need to be able to, first of all, uh, register yourself. So if, if you are a service that does something, you need to be able to say, hi, I'm a service that does something. Here's what I do. Here's what my capabilities are. And so that an orchestration system or whoever is interacting with you knows what your capabilities are. And they are like, okay, great, you do that. Okay, I'll remember that when I need to do whatever you do. Um, so that's registration. Um, status, also fairly fundamental to be able to say um, either I'm a service that's running right now or leave me alone, I'm busy. Uh, here's my state of execution at this point. You know, basic kind of stuff like that. 
Um, control is really the heart of all of this. So once you know about a service or a device, you want to be able to control it, um, have a, a variety of parameter settings, and this is all incredibly extensible. Uh, the number of parameters that we deal with when we deal with devices can be thousands or even like a million parameters for a really complex device that does a, a, a lot of different things. Um, so yeah, that's a, that's a, a, a pretty flexible and extensible um, structure that we've got. Um, commands and APIs, again, being able to, to control the devices through those. The security approach we've taken uh, is based on zero trust tenants. If you're familiar with OAuth 2 uh, and M was IS-10, um, we decided those were great models uh, for authentication and for security. And so there was no reason to reinvent the wheel here. Uh, we'll just simply point to those. Um, and then the uh, final point I'll make and try to make really clearly here is Katina itself is not an orchestration system. It enables you to orchestrate, but it does not do orchestration on its own. Um, yeah, so if you've got, you can still use your favorite orchestration tool, favorite orchestration system, uh, and hopefully Katina just makes your life easier and makes its life easier as well. Um, yeah, so I kind of mentioned before, Katina is very, very scalable to a, a wide variety of, of service sizes. Like I said, from microservices, from a service that does one and only one thing really well, to something that's maybe a little more monolithic and does a, a lot of different things. Um, it'll deal with all of those uh, with, you know, with equal ease. Um, and I did point out earlier, it's, you know, it is designed for, for on-prem and cloud environments uh, and even hybrid. So the idea here is if you have a, a, an environment that does some things on-prem and some things in the cloud, okay, who cares? And that's really where we want to ultimately get. And, and, and I think that's, you know, you shouldn't have to care that a certain service is running on AWS or it's running on a, a local server or whatever, that should be invisible to you. And that's one of the things that Katina allows you to do. It's completely agnostic about what platform things are running on. Uh, so we think that's that's really important to make things work smoothly. So really, the, you know, Katina is modeled around devices. Devices are its, its reason for being, uh, and they can be a variety of things. And you'll see you know, pictures here of a, of a variety of different things uh, that it that it could be from very large, capable, multifunctional devices to very very small things that have um, very small processors. Uh, so it, it, it can support all of those. It can also support things like this right here. Is not what you might think of as a media device. It's a robot. So it's not just for devices that actually touch and manipulate media. Um, it can it can control things like robots for your cameras. It can control your lighting grid, anything. I mean, it's so it's not it's not uh, it's not specific to only devices that uh, and services that touch your uh, uh, touch your media. So um, I'm going to take my glasses off so I can actually read the, the fine print on this one. And I I apologize if it's difficult to uh, to read some of this here, um, but really at at the heart of Katina is a data model for this um, uh, for the how it does the control, the parameters, uh, the status, all that sort of thing. Um, and really what this is talking about is how this, it's really architected for a variety of, uh, of platforms. And um, the key here uh, is that uh, if you plug in new services into your ecosystem, uh, at the bottom here, you do not need to have people, uh, your developers, reprogram them to add new functionality. And this is intended to be dynamically plug and play. So if a Katina compliant service adds a capability, um, that should be able to be picked up immediately by the, by the Katina data model. And you should not have to write new code around that and you know, recompile things to, in order to support that. So I mentioned earlier, you know, one of the, the really the first step in, uh, in a Katina world is the device introduces itself. Um, and so there's a full device description there where you can say, you know, describe everything about your device, how you like to be controlled, um, that sort of thing. Um, and like I said, it, this all has to be able to, to be done while the device is running. Another really important concept here is devices in a Katina world can have sub-devices. So again, we're not just talking microservices here. So if you've got a big device that Katina's talking to and 
you know, it, it has several different devices inside of it. Um, something like a hyper-converged model, uh, where you've got a device that can do a lot of different things. You can have an unlimited number. You've got basically got a tree structure in there of sub-devices that you can uh, define. In fact, there's a picture right there. of um, So you can have, you know, either just a sing single device or a service, or you can have a device with unlimited, theoretically, number of sub-devices there, each one of those with its own set of parameters, commands that could be controlled, uh, and menus, which we'll talk about in, in a little bit here. Um, so I'm gonna kind of go through some of these a little bit quicker, um, but within, the, within the defining a device, um, you at the at the fundamental level you've got parameters and that's just your know, basic stuff is like is this an integer is it a floating point is it an array is it a full structure um and then the bottom thing here to me is is kind of one of the cool things about katina this ui widget hint um this is intended to make it as easy as possible for you as a developer supporting katina if you're if you're writing something that's going to support a katina environment we give you with each device or service a little widget hint that'll say, here's the way we would recommend you control this device. So it might be like an audio, you know, virtual audio fader. Uh, it, you know, it might be a menu selection. It could be any, any type, of, um, type of widget, if you will. And so we provide these hints. Uh, it doesn't mean you have to use them, but it makes it quicker to stand up a UI for controlling Katina devices. So we think that's an, actually a pretty, nice, uh, a pretty nice feature to have in there. Another important thing here that I'm going to focus on on this slide is the concept of OIDs. So, um, so uh, everything in Katina has a, a, what we call an OID, an object identifier, which is just a unique identifier to separate um, that service or that device um, from any other ones. Uh, and so that when we're controlling it, you know, we, we point to a particular OID. Um, you know, here's kind of a, you know, an example service here. Um, where we have things like uh, mentioned, you've got status parameters, so you could say, okay, what's your playout state right now? Are you playing? Are you paused? Are you stopped? That sort of thing. Uh, they can include things like audio meter values, and you can imagine the number of parameters you could have there and the volume of data when you're talking about an audio meter uh, can be absolutely massive, uh, but it does scale up to, uh, to all of that. Um, variety of other other things here and I've kind of already talked I think about control and command so I'm gonna keep moving on um, talked about it being able to scale up let's talk a little bit about security uh, I want to go a little more into depth on that so I mentioned earlier we do follow zero trust tenants which is uh, more or less an industry standard a, a widely accepted approach to security um, and so uh, everything is um, is wrapped around that. Um, we plan on referencing um, OAuth 2 and probably AMWA's IS-10 in this. Um, again, we think that IS-10 has done a great job of constraining OAuth 2 and giving us a really good model for authentication. So, um, so that's what we're gonna, uh, gonna point to. Um, if you're interested in zero trust, um, Really, the, the master document that, design, that, that defines that is a, a document from NIST. You see the number up here. Um, and, and that's really kind of at the heart of all of this. How does that zero trust kind of thing work and how do we see security working within Katina? Really, at the heart of it, you'll see in the, the middle of this picture, we've got something called a PEP, which is a policy enforcement point. And that is the decision maker. Well, actually, there's the policy decision point as well. Um, that, that helps to enforce your security policies. So when somebody comes in and says, hey, I want to access this particular resource or service, it has to pass through a policy enforcement point that'll say, okay, who are you? First of all, I don't trust you is number one. Tell me who you are, what kind of access are you looking for, uh, to which service or which device, and then you know, the, the PEP and the PDP will work together in trying to determine whether it's going to give you access and what the na nature of the access is, is going to be. And so if you don't have sufficient rights to get into something, um, it will strip any items to which you do not have access. It may give you read-only access to some things where it doesn't think you need or deserve to have um, right access or, or any kind of modification access to it. Um, 
Yeah, and uh, so so that's kind of the the model around zero trust is by default nothing is trusted. Uh, you have to establish your credentials, and then um, you know we we authenticate whether you should be allowed in or not, and and at what level. It gets a little bit deeper than that, but that's uh, that's that's kind of it. Um, yeah, so I mentioned before IS10 OAuth2 is what we're pointing at here. Um, you can imagine that security could be very onerous on a on your network traffic if it was not done really thoughtfully, uh, and we've really taken that into account. Uh, that you know. Let's say you know we were checking the status. If we go back to like an audio meter, if we were checking the status of that every frame, uh, you can imagine and 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 then saying, "Oh, do you have rights to look at this? Do you have rights to look at this?" Sixty times a second, uh, that would get a little nuts on your network. Uh, and so we have taken that into account, and we're quite pragmatic about the way uh, the way that's all handled. I know you need a new acronym, right? This industry needs more acronyms. We're really poor in acronyms. So we've invented a brand new acronym, but I think it's an easy one to remember. Uh, and we call it GUSTO. It's the Grand Unified Scopes Theory Optimized for Media Production. Yes, we kind of threw the O in there because otherwise it would be GUST, which we didn't think was a great acronym. But really the idea behind GUSTO here um, is that you have a, a fairly restricted set of roles that people can have. So if people want access to things, first you say, well, I, I'm in this role today. And you know, as we all know, people fulfill multiple roles. So just to, today you might be a journalist, tomorrow you might be a TD, or you might be a producer, who knows? Um, and each one of those has a different set of, of accesses that are, uh, um, that are allowed. So, um, so there's your, you know, so if I'm Colleen uh, and I'm trying to get access to, uh, 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 to something I could say, well, I'm a, I'm a producer in New York City, but I'm also a journalist. Each one of those has the, you know, their own set of, set of rights here. And when I'm trying to access server, services, so let's say I, you know, service A is like a, I'm trying to access the server channel. Um, you know, I, I have either, either have rights to that or I don't. Um, and there's a whole kind of structure here under Gusto of different roles and the different um, authorizations that each one of those has. There's more to this, uh, but I'm kind of going rapid fire through this as we're, uh, we're getting there in time. Um, transport, I won't talk a whole lot about transport other than to emphasize the fact that once again, uh, we're trying not to reinvent the wheel. We really like gRPC, Google Remote Procedure Call. Uh, and so that is used for transporting uh, Katina messages. We think it's very lightweight and very scalable. Um, we looked at a lot of other uh, methods of transport, and we really felt gRPC was the was the right way to go uh, with that. Um, this is totally an eye chart, and I'm going to skip over it uh, with this size uh, size of screen. Um, we've also used protobuf here, so we can uh, we can generate proto files in um, you know at least Java, C++, Go, and Python. Uh, we're starting out with with C++, but you know we'll be adding a lot of these other ones. Um, as we uh, as we move forward, um, and uh, if you're not familiar with gRPC, um, you know there's there's a lot of nice things that come along with uh, with doing that. Uh, but really, at the heart of it is uh, the fact that it's lean and it's scalable, uh, and it you know, it'll allow us to do these large volume um, amounts of traffic uh, efficiently. Um, and I think I'll kind of wrap up with uh, orchestration. Again, the point I made earlier was this is not an orchestration system. You can continue to use whatever orchestration system or method that you uh, that you prefer, um, but uh, this really makes the whole thing um, much much easier. Let's see, five minutes. I can talk a little more maybe about the uh, the UI and media hints. I'll wrap you up in a bit. Okay, okay. I want to leave a little bit of time in case there's some questions, but. Um, so yeah, this menu hints thing, um, super cool. It's one of my favorite um, features here uh, that uh, again, allows you to define a, uh, or, or provides you with a, uh, a hint of, of what type of uh, a menu item that you should use on your UI for it. Um, it does not create a UI for you, just makes it easier for you to create um, a UI. Another kind of note here that we've got with the double asterisks. Uh, if you're familiar 
with with OGP. Um, there is something called OGLML, which is a markup language for OGP. That is, we're not at the moment planning on including that within the Katina specification, but it would work. Uh, so if you're familiar with that markup language, uh, it would it would absolutely work for uh, for Katina. All right. So you know, final thoughts. Um, like I said, uh, we're we're strong believers in this being open sourced and open standard. Um, you know, we think this has a, a, a big, big big value to the industry as a standard. Uh, we're just trying to make it easier to to connect all of your various various devices and services and microservices. Um, the good news is the timing here is really good. Uh, we have just started this initiative uh, within the the OSA, uh, which was just announced yesterday on the show floor that the OSA has now become a SMPT rapid industry solution, um, and so uh, it's the 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 high speed part of SMPT. Uh, we feel that uh, the development of Katina is something that has to be done as quickly as possible. It's not something that can sit in committee for five years. Otherwise, otherwise the industry will have moved on, will have come up with their own answers to this. Uh, so we feel that you know, answers need to be provided quickly. And we think the, uh, the SIPTI rapid industry solution structure is great for that. And uh, that's why we've kind of moved the, the OSA under that. Um, and whoops, a little late to see there. So uh, kind of our timeline here, uh, we just started working on uh, on meeting every other week uh, about a month ago. Uh, so uh, if you want to get involved, this is a great time to get involved. Uh, in the spirit of this happening quickly, uh, we're planning on working on the draft documents uh, between now and IBC timeframe roughly, which is not that far away. Um, we'll see, you know, we're, we're setting aggressive targets here, but I think that's the way you move these things forward quickly. You got to motivate people. Uh, and so, um, planning on having those largely done by September, um, the open source project, uh, at least having it in a, uh, in a initial usable state, uh, again, by IBC is our, is our goal. Uh, and then, you know, to be able to hand over kind of fi you know, final, I should have in quotation marks here, uh, because it would be, you know, as an input into the SMPTE standardization process. But we do have a plan for getting through that rapidly as well. Um, and so a lot of work to do between now and, and September. Um, it's not going to all be done by September, but we hope to have a, uh, it, you know, by and large defined by, uh, by that point. So, um, yeah, I just wrap up with uh, encouraging you if, you're, if you find this interesting, if you'd like to, you know, it's your choice, if you want to be involved in the development of it, we'd love to have you get involved through Simpty's Rapid Industry Solutions and the OSA. Um, if not, Stay tuned and uh, hear what we have to say around IBC timeframe, and we'll give you an update on, on where things stand at that point. So with that, I'm happy to answer any questions anybody has about Katina. Yep. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait. Oh. Hello. Uh, thank you. Uh, is an SD WAN sort of like a uh, where where where's an SD WAN with respect to Katina in terms of uh, functionality? It, it seems like we don't need I don't need to worry about an SD WAN anymore. This is all inclusive. I'm probably not the right person to answer that. Um, well, yeah, okay. Well, just as software defined, yeah, uh, it's like an advancement of VPNs. Like I, right. I have uh, some servers, and you know, in this production, we're going on site, and uh, yeah. Uh, that's basic. I'm, I'm, yeah. Right now, we're figuring that out right now okay. in the wild, and we're using zero tier, you know, to do okay. this. And uh, but it would be nice if there was something specific to like media devices, right? Yeah, yeah. And and that's you know that's really kind of the, the difference between Katina and I think you know other ways that you could do this is that this is designed specifically around media devices and is intended to be completely independent of where those reside. Um, so, you know, it's, it's as agnostic as it can possibly be um, while still being tailored to the needs of, of the media business. And, and it's, it's, it's really all comes down to scalability. Um, you know, the, the, the number of transactions that we're talking about here, uh, you know, can be, you know, simultaneously hundreds of thousands of transactions, maybe millions going on at the same time. So scalability is a, is a key. So I'm not sure if I answered your question specifically, but... Uh, 
is there a setup I can see at the show today or some of this, these connections? Um, no, it, literally we just started a month ago oh, well, um, okay. on this. So it's really, it really is brand new. There are uh, draft documents and we're starting to stand stuff up on GitHub. Um, so if you're interested in looking at any of that, um, if you're a, a SMPTE member, um, you can, you can join their, their RIS program and you get access. They've got a Teams channel and we've been posting everything up there and we'd love to have you take a look at that.